Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I've had a great day so far, and I'm looking forward to spending uh, this evening with you and having a, a, a time to reflect on, on what's been going on in our world, uh, much of it in my lifetime. So um, we're just going to dive right in. Um, little quiz. Anyone know, recognize anything in any of the pictures up on the screen? Okay, this is how we separate the generations, okay? All right, um, those of you who know something that's up there have been around a long time. Those of you who don't need to meet someone who does and have a cross-generational moment. <laughs> All right, so um, the three pictures, one is of course a map of Paris. Anyone know what's in the middle? It looks like Sputnik, but it's not Sputnik. It's the Telstar satellite, okay? Okay, and what's on the other corner? David Brinkley. And what did David, for those, you know, we got some young people in here, all right? So have some mercy, all right? Who's David Brinkley? Or who was David Brinkley? NBC anchor for NBC News, okay? In the 1960s. We are talking the summer of 1962. In the summer of 1962, the Telstar satellite was launched into space. We are still dealing with the implications of what that meant. This was the first live broadcast that allowed a signal to go, a black and white signal. And that's the picture, he's in black and white, okay? Uh, black and white signal to go from Europe to the US or the US to Europe, and I said it that way on purpose. Because it could only go, the signal could only go in one direction. It couldn't go in both directions. So they interrupted my cartoons, okay? <laughs> I was eight at the time, all right? They interrupted my cartoons to, to introduce the revolution that was this satellite. And uh, they broadcast in one direction. They showed a game from Wrigley Field involving the vaunted Chicago Cubs against the Cincinnati Reds, all right? And then they shut the Telstar satellite down, rebooted. You know what a reboot is, right? <laughs> Takes a few seconds on your computer now. Three hours later, <laughs> three hours later, the signal went the other direction, okay? So, I mean, just think about that. Black and white signal only, three hours of reboot, etc. It wasn't, I mean, it was amazing then, it's not so stellar now. And, uh, but it did something that changed our world. It used to be that when something happened somewhere on the globe and it was recorded and it went into the news, you had to take the film, develop it, take it, either develop it on site or fly it to be developed and it might take 24 hours between the thing that happened and the time that you see it, okay? Our world, as a result of this, is bigger and smaller simultaneously. I'm gonna confuse you all night, all right? There are more of us in the world than there have ever been, but we are more tightly connected than we have ever been. And so there are more, the world is bigger and smaller at the same time, as a result of what grew out of what is the technological communication revolution, which we are still dealing with. Okay, so now leap ahead to, uh, what's today? September 7th, 2023. And I'm just curious, how many of you are carrying a weapon tonight? This. All right, yeah, look, no, go, go ahead, show me, show me. Yeah, okay, I was showing a hands. I wanted to see that. There, he's sh she's showing the, he's showing the device. There you go. Hold it up nice and proud. I'm going to do a little exercise later that will reproduce. Uh, how many, I want to see how many of you brought your device with you just in case I was boring. Okay? <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, so there it is. I can literally communicate. Anyone who has a device like this? instantly with anyone around the world. My son lives in Switzerland. 
I was on the phone with him last night. While it was my lunch. It was my granddaughter's dinner. And we were communicating. I could see what she was doing. She could show me what she was doing. She loves Mickey Mouse. And uh, just had a marvelous time. We are, there are more of us and we're more tightly connected than we've ever been. There are things that we can do now that we could not do when I, in, the, in 1962. It changed the world. And what it did is it turned the world into, my analogy is the world has become like a Middle Eastern bazaar. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been to the Middle East and been to a Middle Eastern bazaar. Whenever I think of a Middle Eastern bazaar, I think about, um, I think about the bazaar that I visited in Istanbul. As we were, my wife and I were walking through, a uh, very good salesman immediately understood by listening to us talk that we were speaking in English, switched from German to English and said to us, the fastest way to your mother-in-law's heart is through my shop. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now, I love my mother-in-law, all right, but I didn't buy her anything in Istanbul. And, uh, but the bazaar, you go through a bazaar and there are all kinds of booze and all kinds of things going on. Our world is like a bazaar. And then here's the trick. Some of the booze in that world are pretty bizarre. And we're discovering all the different ways people think and live today and we're more tightly connected to that than we've ever been. And that's the challenge that the church has in the world that we're in today. So what, when we also experience something else in my lifetime, the other thing that we've experienced in my lifetime, although I will say that I'm in a part of the country where it is less visible than it is in other parts of our country, and that is we have suffered the loss of what I call the Judeo-Christian net around our culture. Uh, it used to be there was a, there was a cultural, a shared cultural background that we all possessed. And that shared cultural background were what we call Judeo-Christian values. If you talk with academics, they'll debate whether there ever was such a thing. But there, there, was, there was a belief in the value of the Ten Commandments. There was a belief in the value of what it is that Jesus taught people, etc. And that was fully 50% fully, um, plus people went to church in the 50s and 60s. Now 30% of the people will never darken the door of a church this next Sunday. Um, in fact, have never darkened the door of a church in much of their lifetime. That's different. So we've suffered the loss of the Judeo-Christian net and our world has changed. It's changed. I like to like, I, I like this analogy. It's, we've gone, I said this at dinner, we've gone from being the home team to being the visiting team. Only we're not just the visiting team. We are the visiting team who are the rivals. We get booed at the game. That's happened in my lifetime. So we're now stuck in a position, I'll say it that way, we have to engage with the reality of pluralism. It's around us. There's no escaping it. And coping with pluralism means being more aware of it and more engaged with it. Our tendency is to, with, uh, sometimes with some, is to withdraw from it. I know one of the options that is often uh, bandied about among Christians is to take what's called the monastic view. Okay, monasteries make me nervous, okay, because I'm married, all right? But, um, but that take the to, with, to withdraw. But the moment we withdraw, we do something that is counter-missional. It's called the Great Commission. And how does it go? Go into all the world and what? Make disciples. If we withdraw and don't engage and don't interact with people who are outside the church, we have stepped back from what Jesus called us to do and to be. That is not a good thing to do. Go, it doesn't say go into the church and make disciples, although in some churches that might not actually be a bad move, okay? All right, it says go into the world 
and make disciples. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you do that well? So let me overview what I've just said in my introduction. The Telstar satellite and the challenge of our world is that we are both bigger and smaller at the same time. And the challenge of pluralism is that we're no longer the home team. And I have a thesis tonight. It's going to challenge you. I'm going to tell you I'm challenging you from the get-go. Because we've been fighting a culture war out of the Christian church for the last four decades. And I'm going to submit to you it's misdirected because it's gotten disconnected from our mission. It's done the church damage in the process. I think it's done our society damage in the process. I hope to show you biblically why that is the case and what the corrective needs to be. Because there is a war going on, but it's got to be properly defined. And the solution has got to be properly posited. So I hope to discuss with you this corrective. I'm not going to get to discuss with you one thing that I normally do when I do this series of lectures, and that is how to have a difficult conversation, how to have a conversation with someone who you know is coming from a completely different place, how those conversations work, what are the things we do that damage those conversations, what are the things we can do to advance those conversations so that we have a chance of the conversation being positive. I'm not going to get the chance to do that with you tonight, but it's also part of, of dealing with this space. But I will also focus on a theology of cultural engagement, because my belief is the church does not have a theology of cultural engagement in public space, in pluralistic public space. It needs one. So I'm going to take you through six passages tonight very, very quickly and try and give you a skeleton for cultural engagement. I think there are certain themes that are going to consistently emerge, and they are both going to show what we should be doing and contrast with some of the things that we are doing and raise questions about how we proceed. So there are going to be six key texts to the theology of cultural engagement. That's actually what I'm going to be talking about. And let me start off with Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Now I need to see how, how up to speed you are. How many of you have a Bible that has a thing called pages in it, okay? How many of you have that with you tonight? If you have it with you tonight, hold it up there. Yeah, nice, look at that. nice and proud, all right? Very good, all right? How many of you have your Bible on your device? Look at that, look at that. You know, when I used to do this, it used to be that more people were carrying a Bible that had pages in it than people than they had on their device. Now it's almost exactly the reverse. Let me tell you a little, this is, you didn't pay for this, but this is fun. If you have your Bible on your device, you don't have a smartphone, you have a spiritual phone, okay? <laughs> give the phone credit, all right? You need to give the phone credit for having a Bible on it, all right? So, okay, now let's get serious. Let's talk about Ephesians 6. It, this is the culture war passage in the New Testament. The key verse is verse 12. That's the verse that's on this slide. Let me read it for you the way it ought to be read. For our struggle is not, 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 that was emphatic, <laughs> against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. That verse is loaded. Because it tells us two things. People are not the enemy. Our battle is not against people. If you put in the Great Commission, people are not the enemy, they are the goal. And the second part of this is our battle is a spiritual battle with spiritual forces. One of the Greek words in these verses is the word cosmocrat. It's the Greek word cosmocrat. If you think a bureaucrat is bad, you should meet a cosmocrat. All right? So we've got this spiritual battle, but I'm going to put this verse in context. So back up if you have your device with you to Ephesians 6.10. And if you scroll there or if you have a Bible, open it up to Ephesians 6.10, however you want to get there. And I'm going to read the text. I'm going to comment on it as we go through. Finally, be strengthened in the Lord and the strength of his power. Clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. In this passage, we are never told to take new ground. In this passage, we are told to hold the ground we've already been given because we've saved. 
For our struggle, here's our verse. Oh, clothe yourself with the full armor so you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so you may be able to stand your ground. There it is a second time. On the evil day and having done everything to stand. Stand therefore, and then he's going to name the armor. And the armor are elements of our lived out faith. The armor is consistently living out our faith, both individually and as a community. It's not our political ideology. It's not anything else than our lived out faith. Stand firm, therefore, by, path, by fastening the belt of truth around your waist. Okay, so truth. But truth is defined in a particular way in Ephesians. It is not just the content of truth. It is ethical truth. You are taught truth in Jesus. Just as the truth is in Jesus, it says, put off the old man, put on the new. And you're talking about living with the virtues of the character of what it means to image God in the world. Put on the belt of, fastening the belt of truth around your waist. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness begins to push us in the ethical direction about how we're living. We're living, in a, we're living righteously. We're doing the right thing. I'll talk more about that when we get to the next passage. By fitting your feet with the preparation that comes from the good news of peace. The gospel is part of the armor. And in all of this, taking up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with every prayer, petition, and prayer at all times in the spirit. To this end, be alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And then he asks for prayer for himself and he moves on. Look at what the armor is. It's truth. It's righteousness, by which we mean lived out righteousness. It's the good news of peace. It's our faith. It is our salvation. It is the word of God. And it's something we are supposed to display. That's important. So let me uh, play with this a little bit. I want you to join an organization that I want to form. It's called the GIA. God's intelligence agency, all right? And I want us to think about the military image that's in this passage, because the military image that's in this passage is not of one battalion overrunning another battalion. Remember, we're just standing our ground. It is the picture of rescue. The spiritual forces that stand against us are unseen. They operate behind the curtains. So what do you do about that? I'll come back to this image. Second, as I've said, people are not the enemy, they're the goal. Which means that when someone is opposed to the gospel, I do not see them as an enemy of God. At least initially, I see them as a potential for someone to reconnect to the living God. Third, the battle is spiritual, and so it requires spiritual resources, and it's spiritual resources that are named as the armor. And then here's the trick. The enemy at work in the world operates incognito. Now let me develop that. See, it's one thing for someone to be kidnapped and to know they're in danger. When you go to rescue them, they can't wait for you to get there and release them from the trap that they find themselves in. But the devil works incognito. Some people don't even believe he exists, much less works. And so they're trapped by something they don't even recognize as there. In some cases, they don't even recognize they're in danger. That makes the rescue harder. It's one thing to rescue someone who knows they're in trouble. It's another thing to rescue someone who has no clue. So that changes the metaphor. But the metaphor is this. You are part 
of a special forces group, the GIA, whose assignment is to rescue someone who is trapped in a spiritual environment that they may not even recognize. That makes all the difference in the world if I'm approaching someone with that understanding than saying, you are an enemy who I need to crush. How are we doing? Doing okay? One down, five to go. All right, here we go. Here's the next one. Next one comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, this was the passage that I preached on in chapel today. So if you were in chapel today, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. But it really is an important passage. In the middle of this passage, we have what is normally a memory verse in a Bible verse memory program. It is the idea of setting Christ apart in your heart. Okay, and be prepared to, be, to give a defense for the hope that is in you. It's almost in any memory verse that you see. It's in, uh, it's in I, I don't know of a memory verse program that doesn't have this. But I want to look at this passage in context, and then I want to walk through it. So let's back up to verse 13. Verse 13 says, For who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? Okay, you know, sometimes the Bible makes sense. Okay? Right? So you go, who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? That's, that's what I told my kids when they were growing up. That's what I want my kids to tell my grandkids. Do the right thing. Um, don't get into trouble. Do the right thing. This is, um, you, do, you do good and things should go well. <laughs> you do good and things should go well. Only there's one problem. We live in a fallen world. So we get verse 14. Here's what verse 14 has to say. But in fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right. Now, it's very easy to read this passage and blow by that little phrase. If you happen to suffer, but if in fact you happen to suffer for doing what is right. What? You just told me to do the right thing. Suffer for doing what's right. That's the world we live in. We live in a fallen world. Sometimes happens. And if it happens, you're blessed. What? See, we live in a discombobulated, dysfunctional world. This invokes what I call box law. Box law is every good deed will get punished. Okay? Okay? We live in a fallen world. Every good deed will get... We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus spent the whole second half of his ministry with his disciples telling them, if you follow me in the way of the cross, you will get pushback from the world. Don't be surprised. It's coming with the territory. And then it goes on to say this. Do not be terrified of them or be shaken. The way I'm supposed to respond to this pushback, which I'm inevitably going to get from the world because I may suffer for doing the right thing, is that I am not supposed to be terrified or fearful or shaken by the person who brings injustice my way. Now, here's a question of application. Is that how the church is reacting today to the pressure that it feels itself under? How much of what we do we do because we are afraid or shaken. And how much of what we do denies this Bible verse? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Then we get our verse. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope you possess. The phrase give an answer in some translations give a defense. It's the word apologia. We get the word apologetics from that part of the verse. But that's not what I want to zero in on. I want to zero in on the fact that this is described as hope. Because Peter had one word that he could summarize our faith with, and he decided to choose the word hope. And I would submit to you that if I were to walk out into most churches and say, you get to summarize our faith in one word, what word would you choose? Hope would not be in the top five. In fact, I ran the experiment this morning in the chapel. I got love, I got Jesus, I got the cross, I got discipleship, I got forgiveness. Hope was nowhere to be found. And yet, Peter, when he's presenting what it is that we're defending in the end, is this idea of hope. 
that he's defending. Our faith is ultimately worth sharing because it contains hope. The good news is good news. Don't misunderstand me here, but I'm going to say this harshly. The good news is good news not just because of what happened on the cross, but because of what happened after. What happened after was the resurrection. What happened after was the idea that there's new life now that sin has been forgiven. What happened after is the offer that God is going to come and work us on us from the inside out. And at the core of the gospel, is, there are two elements. There's the work of the cross that has us dead to sin. And then there's the raising from the dead that has us alive. Now, I did this for the people at dinner. And I also did this in the chapel. So some of you are hearing this for the third time. But I love doing this, so I'm going to do it three times. Okay? I want to picture what it means when you only talk about the cross. When you only talk about the cross, the risk is you may not be sharing the good news and the hope. It's like this. Think about baptism. I understand that you all are, do immersion like the Southern Baptists do, so we're among friends. All right? Okay? We don't pour and we don't sprinkle. Get that weak stuff out of here. Here's the picture coming from Romans 6. All right? We're dead to sin. Okay, so this is what happens if it's just the cross. You go in the water, and it's immersion, so your head's going down. You aren't just dead to sin, you're dead. <laughs> but Romans 6 says, you're raised to new life. I don't get to the hope without the new life. If I don't have that second element, I have not shared the good news. I've only shared a part of it. I've actually shared the part that sets up the good news part. The good news part is you get the Holy Spirit if you believe in what it is that God has offered. And God comes into your life and you get to be born again. Amen. Okay? You got to say that like a Baptist. Okay? It's born again. A-G-I-N. We preach that from the pulpit. Okay? <laughs> Y'all be born again. That's the hope. The hope is that you have been made in the image of God. And you have been made to image God because you've been made in his image. And the only way that happens in a dysfunctional world, because remember up there in the earlier passage, we said, oh, just do what's right. But if you do suffer for doing what's right, you know, something's wrong. The only way that changes is with heart change. That's why we need the gospel. That's why we have the church. So set Christ apart in your heart. And always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope you possess. But we're not done with this passage. It goes on to say this. Yet do it. The setting apart of Christ in your heart and giving this defense to people who are pressing against you, do it with courtesy and respect. That's prautitas and phobos. Those are the two Greek words. One means gentleness, sometimes translated courtesy because that's how it comes across. Or phobos, fear, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord in the Greek version of the Hebrew text. Phobos is the word in that verse in Proverbs. Yet do it with courtesy and respect. What I'm saying is tone matters. We have a message of hope that I hope we get to whenever we're interacting with people who don't share our faith. And we are supposed to do it with a certain tone. Keeping a good conscience so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ... Notice that phrase, that's the second time it's been mentioned. Your good conduct in Christ has been slandered. Every good deed will get punished. May be put to shame when they accuse you. For it is better to suffer for doing good. There it is a third time. It is better to suffer for doing good if God wills it than for doing evil. Whoa. I'm in a position in the world in which I am vulnerable. That's what that says. Are we willing to go there? 
Why do we do it? Why do we do this very unnatural thing? Verse 18. Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. So Christ did. Christ was in a position of righteousness, doing the right thing. And what did he get for it? He got the reward of the cross. He got the reward of the cross. Every good deed will get punished. The just for the unjust. Oh yeah, that's why he did it. He did it for them. No, 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 no. There's a curveball in this passage. It's coming in the next line. To bring you to God. Why do you do it? Why do we do it? We do it because we remember where we came from. And we remember how we got into our relationship with God. We got into our relationship with God not because of anything we did, but because of everything he did. What this passage is saying is, you have a chance when you're engaging with someone on the outside to replicate the way God approached you. And the way God approached you is your back was turned to God. And he tapped you on the shoulder and got your attention because he loved you enough to care for you even though your back was turned to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I like to shorten that verse to this. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. And we have the chance to replicate that experience, and that's why we do it. Because we appreciate God's grace. Because we understand what He's done for us. Because we never forget where we came from without Him. And where we would be without Him. So we do it this way. Okay, that's two down, four to go. I'm going to move more quickly now. The next passage is Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders. Making the most of the opportunities. That's already an interesting expression. Making the most of the opportunity. My engagement with an outsider is an opportunity. It's not a hassle. It's not a frustration. It's an opportunity. Let your speech always, 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 always. That was emphatic. Be gracious. Season with salt so that you may know how you should answer everyone. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Because it always is a technical term. What does always mean? Always. Okay, he did it. He did it. Okay, I tell people, please don't give me a definition that is the word. Okay? All right? But he's right. Always means always. So let's think about how do we, always means what else? All the time. All the time. All right? All the time. So, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, 365 days a year, 366 in a leap year, you don't get to take a day off every four years. Always means always. Let your speech always be gracious. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. This deals with our speech. It's still tonal. Just like the courtesy and respect. I'm gracious in the way I interact with those who I'm trying to draw into the invitation of this gospel. I forgot to say something in 1 Peter. It's this. The gospel is made up of two parts. There's a challenge that is the cross and there is the invitation into the gospel and into the good news. We oftentimes are struggling with, I want to make so sure that people understand their need for God that I emphasize the challenge and never get to the invitation. Trouble is when I do that, in one sense I never get to the good news. And the invitation is undertaken in such a way to bring the good news of the gospel, I'll just repeat myself, the good news of the good news to people. So we need to be inviting in how we engage. That means being courteous. That means being respectful. That means 
being gracious. Another text. Three down, three to go. So then, whenever you have an opportunity, there it is again, whenever you have an opportunity, let us do good to all, 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 you know the drill, that's emphatic, people, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. Another technical term, it begins with the letter A. I think God wants us to get it from the start, okay, from the very beginning, okay? All, all means? Now you did it again. All means everyone. No exceptions. Okay? Now notice, this is different than Colossians. Colossians was about our speech. This is about our actions. How we relate to people. So then we have opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the faith. Now I'm going to do something that's going to be a real challenge. There are often situations where we teach and preach the text and we're debating about what the scope of the audience is. Where we do something like this. We say, well, this is, so, this is for believers and believers only. So I don't have to act this way to people outside the faith. This text will not allow you to make that move. This text is saying you're supposed to treat everybody the same. Without exception, now it certainly should be happening among the people of God. That's for sure where it should be happening, but it also should be happening everywhere. Do you know what's behind and underneath this? What kind of love makes Christianity distinctive? Who do you love? You love your enemies. You know what Jesus said about the people who just love, the people who love them? Give yourself a reward. Sinners do that. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to be in contrast. So I'm supposed to treat everyone with the same regard. I'm supposed to try and do good to everyone, and I certainly don't put myself in a situation where I treat one group of people one way and another group of people another way. I'm supposed to love equally. That's actually painful to think about. Four down, two to go. So then, if anyone is in Christ, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look what is new has come. And all these things are from God, who has reconciled to himself, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's another verse where a singular word is summarizing what our faith is all about. And here the word is reconciliation. We have a ministry of reconciliation. That reconciliation is not just between myself and God. That reconciliation is between myself and God and others. I wish I had time to develop this. This is so important. The whole purpose of salvation, viewed through the lens of Ephesians 2 and 3, is that we are saved by grace so that we can be the workmanship of Christ, so that we can walk in good works which God prepared beforehand. That's Ephesians 2.10. It comes right after the Protestant creed about salvation being by grace. And then the next, if you ask the next question, which is, so what are some of the good works that we are supposed to show? The next passage is the answer to that question in 2.11 to 22. Because in 2.11 to 22, it talks about God forming the new man. And the new man is Jew and Gentile together. These are estranged people who did not get along being made family by God. And we're supposed to see that. Not just me and my God, but God and us. Taking two estranged people and making them say, I'm going to make you family. And so what that says is God has adopted us. And the question becomes, have we adopted one another? who has given us this ministry of reconciliation. In other words, Christ, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's transgressions against them, trespasses against them, 
And he has given us the message of reconciliation. And now listen to verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We have one passport. That passport is we are citizens of heaven. It transcends. I almost used another word. It transcends any nationalist association that we have. We are ambassadors for Christ as though we're God we're making. Notice the tone. His plea through us. We plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the invitation. That's the good news. It's being put in. Reconnect to the living God. Reconnect to the Creator. Reconnect to the one who can give you location. If you listen to the world carefully today, people are searching for who they are and where they belong. So they create their own identities. How does that happen? Because if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in a creator and you happen to be here as a kind of cosmic a accident, the only thing that makes sense is to try and figure out who you are and pretend whoever you are is who you are. And so that's what the world does. It's the only other option. So people do it. And if you listen to it, sometimes they struggle with it because they'll say things like, I'm trying to find myself. And whenever I hear this phrase, I go, you're trying to find yourself? I thought I was looking at you. Do we hear the cry of people who, in the language of Acts, say, are groping after God? And do we listen for that? In the pain that exists in our world, in the depression that exists in our world, in the dislocation that exists in our world. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. That's God tapping us on the back and saying, I love you. One more. Passage that never gets mentioned in this conversation. Summarizes everything I've been saying to you tonight. But keep away from youthful passions. This is 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26. But keep away from youthful passions. And pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You may not notice this at first, but this is the armor of God coming back at you, not expressed as a metaphor, but said directly. It is our lived out faith that we wear as virtues, that shines as light, that is our armor. Our armor is the contrastive way we live as individuals and as community in a world where we live differently than the way the rest of the world does. But reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed infighting. The Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes but be kind towards, oh no, all our technical term just came back at us one more time. An apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with, oh, come on, gentleness. There's our tone coming back at us once again. And then there's this. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and then knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they are held captive to do his will, and we are right back where we started in Ephesians 6. It's a spiritual battle. It requires spiritual resources. We cannot expect that people who do not have the Spirit of God will live like people who have the Spirit of God. And when we misdirect our efforts and bypass the gospel, and bypass what it means to have a changed life, we are not presenting what people need. It's a big mistake. It's a toxic mistake. Because what has happened is, we find people in the church who are defending things that 15 years ago they would have never defended. How did that happen? 
because we see the battle the wrong way. People are not the enemy. They are the goal. God died for every one of us when our backs were turned to him. It is the responsibility of Christians to show that we are the objects of God's grace. We do not show we are the objects of God's grace when we insist we are different than the people we're talking to. The only thing that makes a difference is the grace of God. And we should show that in how we engage. So tone matters. It matters one heaven of a lot. And that's how you fight the real culture war with a real solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bach. Would you join me sure. up here? And um, we'll have some discussion. Um, from where I was sitting there, it looks like the back leg of this chair is like kicked under there, but I just had to check. It's so not, we'll it's good. So we'll pray you stay up. It's, <laughs> it's good, it's good. Uh, well, we're delighted to have you here with us today. Um, I've had the opportunity both to uh, hear you in chapel and lunch and <clears throat> appreciate that. Appreciate what you've said tonight. Um, let's get down to brass tacks okay. on some things. Okay. First, I need to tell the audience, we've got a QR code. And if you would please use that uh, to send questions. And we'll get questions from our audience here in just a moment. But I've got uh, a few to start us off as those come in. And the first one is... Um, is this, I want to I pick up where you ended, and mm -hmm. you said, tone matters. Um, when we're asked to do good to all people, and drawing from your experience, um, how do we do good to those um, who don't even think that what we're doing is good, but instead that it cancels them and disrespects them. How do we engage with that? The first rule is you love them no matter what. Um, you love them no matter what. You, um, you take the hit, if I can say it that way, and yet you continue to try to engage them and relationally connect with them. Doesn't mean you don't challenge them. Okay, I said there's challenge in the gospel. Sure. Doesn't mean you don't, but how you challenge them is important. How you frame the fact that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God might be a good starting place. Uh, we all need God might be a good starting place. What we tend to do is to form our discussion so that there's us, the good guys, and them, the bad guys. And when we do that, um, we ignore the Peter passage in which the idea is, um, this is what God did when he drew you to God. So you love them no matter what. You try and maintain as best as you can the tone that you have. When you challenge, you challenge with sensitivity. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes you point out, sometimes you put what I, when I have the other talk on difficult conversations, I talk about putting a rock in someone's shoe. Uh, this comes from Greg Kunkel, who, uh, mm -hmm. who talks about tactics. Mm -hmm. And a rock in a, you know what a rock in a shoe is? It's, you get a rock in your shoe and it irritates you, right? Sure, right. I mean, you take your step and, oh, I feel that rock, right? And your first reaction is to move your foot around and shake it in the hopes that God providentially gave you a big, big enough arch in your foot to put the rock <laughs> underneath your arch, right? So you can walk and not feel it, okay? But some of us aren't so blessed, all right? So what do we do? We end up eventually taking the shoe off and taking the rock. But as long as that rock is there, I'm thinking about it. 
So part of what we do in our conversations is put a, you put a rock in, in your shoe when you take a premise that someone else has and make them think about it. So um, in the book, I actually work through Acts 17 where Paul does this. Mm -hmm. He opens up respectfully. He says to a group of people who have idols all over the place. In fact, the text is clear. He walked around Athens and he saw all the idols and he was provoked is the Greek word. Now, let me <laughs> translate that for you in average angle. What it means by provoked is his blood pressure changed. <laughs> all right. He was not happy at all these idols. And yet he goes to address this crowd and his starting point is, I see that you are very religious. And I read, the, read that verse, and sometimes I think, Paul, I'm a child of the 60s. What have you been smoking? <laughs> Here's what he's saying. I see you're interested in spiritual things, so let's talk spiritual things. And that's his way in. And then he raises a question. This is the rock and the shoe part. He says, do you really think that the God who is responsible for all this creation can be contained in a building that man builds or in an object that man makes. That's the rock in the shoe. All right, so that's a challenge. He's challenging them directly, but he's doing it by trying to make them think and process where they are. And sometimes we're so interested in showing where we are, we don't think about getting them to wrestle with where they are. Mm -hmm. And we don't listen well for those places and take advantage of those opportunities when they come up. And it may be that sometimes it comes up and someone shares a value and you go, you know what, I actually share that value, but you handle it this way and I handle it that way. That produces a different kind of conversation as well. So putting a rock in someone's shoe is thinking through the places where you can respond to them. But the goal is not to embarrass them. It's just simply to get them to stop and think about where they are and why. The only way you can do that is if you take enough time to listen to someone to understand where they're coming from and why. And you let them tell you. You don't assume a motive. You let them tell you where they're coming from. And then you use what they tell you to engage in a conversation. Those can be hard conversations. It's going to be hard conversations. And there are things we do that kill those conversations. There are things that we do that advance those conversations. Let me tell you a couple of things that we do that kill those conversations. The first one is what I call the pivot. I'm actually taught this in, in public relation, by public relations people because I have to speak for the institution every now and then as a head of a center. So we actually teach us how to do this, okay? You get asked a question, you know, Scott's gonna shake his head, he knows what I'm talking about. You get asked a question that puts your position in an uncomfortable place. And they tell you, either acknowledge it quickly, but then turn, it's called the pivot. Talk about something else as quickly as you can, or pretend you didn't hear the question, and talk about what you wanna talk about. Just connect it to the question somehow, okay? It's called the pivot. It's called, sometimes it's called whataboutism. Someone will show something your way that shows that you're coming up short and you go, well, what about this, okay? And what you've just done is go, okay? You've just changed directions of the conversation and you've just disrespected the person who brought the point up to you they want you to talk about. That's one. Second way we do it is what I call the exorcism. <laughs> the exorcism is debate by labels. Everybody does it. Not just conservatives and not just liberals. Everybody does this. It is how we advertise our politics and we wonder why our politics is toxic. Here's how it works. I'm gonna show you it's an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> L, liberal, M, Marxist, C, conservative, F, fundamentalist, okay? Now, I've, I've, gone, I've done the spectrum, 
All right? Both sides do it. Here's the point. I label you and then I do this. The label is designed to bury you. The label is designed not to have a substantive conversation. The label is designed to drape you in black and may you rest in peace. And we never have the conversations with one another that we need to have as a result. It is a community killer. And everybody does it. And it is wrecking our public space. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, you definitely covered the spectrum there. Yeah. No, one, no one goes away unscathed. In no, the no, no, one. no. We've got some questions uh, from our audience. And um, the first one, you said people are defending things they would not have 25 years ago. Could you expand on that? I sure can. Would you please? How many of you know the name Bill Clinton? How many of you know what Bill Clinton was accused of doing in public? How many of you know he lied about what he did in public? How many people in the church condemned what Bill Clinton did in the public? Do I need to go any further? How many of you know the name? Am I going to say it? I think you probably will. <laughs> Donald Trump. You said it. Look at what he's done. Look at what we are defending. It's tragic. Young people look at that and they go, if that's the way your faith works, I want to have nothing to do with it. I talk to young people on a regular basis. Um, I see them react to what's going on around them. They are desperate for a different kind of model in our public spaces. And that model doesn't work for the church. At lunch today, to pick up on, to pick up on that, um, some will interpret what you just said or will want to interpret what you just said as political. And while it has some political roots, I don't, I don't gather that you, you're thinking in terms of politics so much. Um, so what's the concern? What, what is it that has... Boil down the concern to one word, character. And for the church? Well, the point is, character matters in leaders. Character matters for what it models to society. Character matters for being exemplary of the things I want my kids to emulate. Character matters. We're talking about public space. We're talking about people and the way that they live. It is politics. Politics isn't just what political party you belong to. Politics is about the way people relate to one another. It comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. So po it is politics. But it's politics in the broadest and most important sense of the term. How are we going to live together as the diverse group of people that we are? And I'm back to where I start with the Telstar satellite. There are more of us. And there are more different views. There are many boos in the bazaar, and some of them are bizarre. And I've got to be able to cope with that in one way. I also need to not be surprised that the world is the world. And um, what I ought to be surprised of is when the church is like the world. So 
So as a final question, part of the bio that we have for you here is that you are an elder emeritus for church. Means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> but it also suggests to me, and also given your profession, that you've been a teaching pastor for a number of years. Correct. So, what would you say has been one of your hardest moments as a teaching pastor where you and others had to swallow hard to respond to persecution or martyrdom with courtesy and respect? It's never easy. You cannot do it without the persevering presence of God. You cannot do it with a deep belief that in the end, God has you in his hands. Um, so, I mean, my answer is, is that um, anyone, anyone, who's, anyone who's a leader in a Christian institution who understands that people will criticize you for the decisions that you make, box law will apply, every good deed will get punished. Someone will notice it, and they will call it a bad deed. Um, and part of, it is, part of it is trying, one, to be certain that you aren't misstepping, that, it, that the criticism is, not just, is justified in taking that to heart. And the second part of it is if you determine that it's unjustified, it's being gracious. Because you know who's the most gracious person of all? Jesus Christ. He went to the cross <coughs> as a result of one of the greatest injustices ever, per, 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 ever uh, purposed for any human being. And the amazing thing is, he did it because he loved us that much. I tell people, most people don't think about this. I tell people that when Jesus is asked, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And he answers that question. And he says, yes, and you will see the son of man coming on the clouds, seated at the right hand of God. That Jesus actually supplies the testimony that sends him to the cross. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a second. They were trying to trap him. They brought other witnesses, etc. They went through all this effort to try and get something that they could take to Pilate. They couldn't do it. They asked him this question. This question is the answer to their problem because Jesus says, in effect, I am the king who God sent. And in the Roman, Greco-Roman world, that didn't work. Because in the Greco-Roman Empire, Rome appoints the kings in the empire. No one else does. And Romans believed in law and order. You follow our law or we will put you in order. <laughs> okay? And so he ended up on the cross. And he supplied that testimony. That's how he endured the shame. And he called it in the discipleship passages, bearing the cross. The question we have as a church is, are we willing to? To bear the cross. Hmm. I don't think we can end on a better, more sober word than that. I thank you for being here. Let's thank our guest, Dr. Bach. <laughs>